This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. Thank you for thank you for my mask servants being here today. And thank you for those choosing to tune in. Because this is going to be a great day because we get to learn about the Lord today. I hope you are as excited as we are to be a part of this. Because we have the greatest church in the whole world. Not, not just in Walker County. Not just in Texas. Not just in America. But in the whole world. Amen. Okay. So let the church say amen again. Amen. <laughs> okay. So thank you for listening in. Okay, I'm going to pass it to somebody. <laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. It's a blessing to be here. I'm glad to see so many faces. I don't see any smiles because they're all covered up. Oh, there's one back there. Okay. Well, I want to wish everybody a good morning, a good Sunday morning. I, for one, am glad to be here to share this time with y'all in fellowship. And if y'all will stand and get your hymnals, we will turn to page 305 and sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. And we will do all four verses. Whenever you're ready. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back. No turning back My cross I'll carry Till I see Jesus My cross I'll carry Till I see Jesus My cross I'll carry Till I see Jesus No turning back No turning back The world behind me the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Brother Jim. Amen. Well, I'm glad you're here and it's good to see. Good to see your eyes, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited about you being a part of our service this morning. In fact, I, I uh, well, I just, I've been, my wife's been concerned about me because I've been so excited. She said, you're not going to be able to sleep last night. Well, I did. I slept pretty good, and uh, it was good. And, uh, but anyway, I'm glad you're here, and it's good to be back in service. It's good to see uh, uh, several of our pews, many of our pews are being used, and that's good. See some faces, amen. And uh, so I'm glad you're here. Are you glad to be here? Yeah. I hope you are. I sure am. And uh, we've got some great things planned. All right, you have your Bible out. Let's take them out and hold them up and make our declaration about the grand old book. Are you ready? Say it with me. This is my Bible. It's God's holy word. It's given to teach me truth, to reprove me of sin, to correct me when I'm wrong, and instruct me in what is right. It's a lamp into my daily walk and a light into my eternal path. And if I hide His words in my heart, then I will not sin against God. This is my Bible, and it can change my life today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to... All right, you can be seated if you would. Uh, a few quick announcements, and we'll get on. Uh, we are having a unified Sunday school at 945 in here. 
uh, Brother Jeff's going to be teaching uh, this week, and then next week, uh, Brother Hank uh, Futrell's going to be teaching. So we're going to try to use the different teachers that would like to teach. Uh, we're going to put them to work. Uh, so anyway, but that'll be at 945, and it will be online. If you'd like to watch it online, you can. And then the 11 o'clock service, uh, we're having our regular 11 o'clock service and hope to have folks come for that. We'll also have 6.30 tonight uh, as we continue through the book of Exodus. And uh, excited tonight, we um, get to see the rod of God, uh, the rod that uh, God uses ahead of Moses. Anyway, that's tonight, and then uh, Acts, of course, on Wednesday night. So uh, each, you're welcome to come to any service that we have, and we understand. If, and it's interesting to look around because, uh, I, I, you know, I thought, well, we were talking about who would, who would be coming. And we said probably uh, folks with children wouldn't be here, and that's pretty well true. And then uh, the small children, that is. And then, um, and then probably some of our senior adults wouldn't be here. And that's kind of true. But there's a bunch of us seniors that are here. <laughs> yeah, no. Here I am. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, it's, it's just good. And we just don't know. But I know that as we move through this month, I hope by the end of the month we're going to be, uh, I hope we're going to be almost full bore again. We're, they're allowing us just to be able to be free to do it. But uh, we're going we're gonna to respond by the way they've given us. And we're going to continue to do what we do. And uh, we are honored to be a part of uh, what God's doing in our nation right now. I had a call from a, a, I had a, you're not going to believe this, I had a call from a mega church pastor from down near Houston called me and uh, was asking, what are y'all doing? <laughs> I told him, he said, man, I wish we could do that. And I know, I, I, I told him, I said, I can't even imagine a church your size trying to do what we're doing. And he said, we just can't. And so they're waiting until the 24th to start church. But you know, a lot of churches are open this morning. Praise the Lord for that. And what? And I told him, I said, you know, the neat thing about it, I said, your church hasn't, won't have changed a lot because you've been doing all these ministries. But us little guys out here, we've been, this is all new to us. And I said, all of a sudden, we're, we're televised, you know. <laughs> we've never been televised. And uh, so we're reaching people we've never reached before. And it's exciting to see what God's doing. Technology. You know, Daniel talks about that in the last days, technology will explode. Well, aren't you glad that it has? Because look what God's going to use it for. And uh, people are watching like never before. And uh, they're seeing and hearing the Word of God like never before. And it's exciting. The only thing is they can cut us off. But it's what somebody said. The only bad thing about coming back to church is we can't turn you down or turn you off. That's true. <laughs> Well, anyway, it's going to be good. I'm glad you're here. And uh, we're going to have Jerry come lead us in another song. And then uh, I have a, we have a special by one of our special young, young ladies who's going to come give us a special. All right. Brother Jerry. All right. Let's stand. Page 309. Lord, I'm coming home. Gordon, if you're out there, we miss you. This is your job. I hope I'm filling in so y'all help me out on this song. I know it, but I don't start it off very well. So y'all sing up loud. Ready? I'm wandered far away from home. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming. Yeah. 
Page. We have a special this morning, Miss Page. You like it? Mm -hmm. Okay. The news came to Jesus. church, doesn't it? <laughs> Woo! It feels like church. My goodness. Man, I just love it. Piano playing, congregation singing, special music by our little songbird, and whew, and talking about four days too late. Man, I tell you, God's always on time, isn't He? Amen? Amen, He is. Well, I tell you what, take your Bibles out and go to Romans chapter 6, if you would, as we step off into another chapter. I, uh, Paul is moving us 
from having Christ's righteousness to having his righteousness revealed in our daily living. From receiving that new divine nature to living in that new nature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 is a favorite verse of ours. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. And so we know that from the point of salvation, there's something that happens. And we begin to move into living a new life. Something that's different. Understanding terminology sometimes help us. Justification is a one-time act that takes place at salvation. We are justified from our sins. That's justification. Sanctification is a process that from the time of our salvation, with the work of the Holy Spirit now in us, that changed new nature by the new man that's in us, we begin to move now to sanctification, which is walking in our salvation, walking in that grace, learning to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then there's a term called glorification. That's a one-time act. So the one-time act of justification, salvation, sanctification, the process, glorification takes place when we are translated into our eternal home. And that takes place there where we're glorified. We're made like Christ. We are we receive our glorified bodies. It's a one-time thing. So Paul is moving us from, from justification. Now in chapter 6, he's saying, now then that you've got an understanding of that, let's move now to the next level. Let's go on to, let's go on to sanctification. Let's begin that process to living lives of holiness in that grace. We ended last week on Romans 5, 20 and 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. The law revealed our sin, but grace saved us from sin. And now grace moves us on to living above sin. Because sin has reigned unto death, grace can now reign unto eternal life. So if sin is the reason... We have grace. Then according to what we're going to read in chapter 6-1, it looks like maybe sin is a good thing. Right? Wrong. Wrong. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you for this morning. I pray that you'll help us as we look into this text and to realize, Father, what you're doing in our lives. Father, many of us have been satisfied with salvation, which we should be. But, Father, there's so much more. And many, Father, are satisfied just to get in the gate. And they fail to realize the journey that you have for them is awesome. And might we realize today, Father, that we have a life that you've given us to live for you and to live it in abundance. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Paul starts out. (laughs) Paul is a uh, kind of got a lawyer mind. And as he's. As he's thinking through, as the Holy Spirit's giving him these thoughts, his mind also races to questions that might be raised. The lawyer mentality in him would be the answer a question before it's asked. And so here he has a question from probably what would we term the legalist. And we see it in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It seems like such a ludicrous assumption. That if we continue in sin, we will in some way provide more grace to come. And Paul here is anticipating that question where in sincerity, and I say that, I believe in sincerity, these legalists might even assume this to be true. Oh, so grace abounds where sin abounds. Grace abounds even more where sin abounds. So the more sin we have, the more grace we have. You see the thinking? But I hope you see the, the lunacy of that statement. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So, but I wonder, maybe that's the way we have become to think of grace. Now think about it. Think about it. 
Do we just continue in sin knowing that there's always forgiveness and grace available? I mean, I think sometimes people do that. I think, you know, well, I, I'm tempted to do this, and I know if I do it, I know it's wrong, but I can always ask forgiveness later. I, there's grace enough for it. The preacher said so. The Bible says so. Where sin abounds, grace must work. So I know there's going to be grace for this, so it'll be all right if I sin. I know. We say no, but we sin, don't we? There's something that, that's there. I think there is a portion of us that takes for granted this thing called grace and mercy that God gives us. Has our confession of sin just become our get out of free card when it comes to our sin? Do we, do we use it so blatantly? Do we, do we accept that so blatantly? Just can't, we, we canvas our sin. We just broad stroke. Comes the end of the evening. You know, hey, Lord, I'm a little tired tonight. Just forgive all the sins. I don't know what all they are, but I know you'll forgive me. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Do you see what? That in itself is almost what these people are saying. Shall we just sin more because grace is available to us? I mean, why not? I think we need to take sin a little more seriously than that. It's not that we can lose our salvation, but it sure hinders us from walking in God's grace. And if there's one thing I want to get across this morning, and I don't even know if my notes even take us there, but my heart is this there, is that, look, if you are saved, live like it. Amen. Experience that grace, not just in your salvation. Experience that grace in every day of your walk. Experience that forgiveness. Experience that mercy. Experience all that God has for you as you walk in this wonderful thing called grace. Paul answers it this way, and I like it. He says, God forbid. This expression is the strongest Greek phrase for repudiating that statement. It contains a sense of outrage. It's not just God forbid. It is God forbid that. What's wrong with your thinking to think? That's what he's saying. You hear? You say, preacher. You had not preached in a while. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been preaching. But now I got some faces. I got some people to respond to. <laughs> but he said, good night. What's wrong with you? How can you even think that? God forbid that that be your thought life. Don't let that even enter into you. He said, we are, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, he promotes here the fact that we have died in Christ. We die in Christ. This is not a reference to the believer's ongoing daily struggle with sin, but, it, but to the one-time event that took place at salvation. God forbid we are dead to sin. When did that happen? At salvation. It's a one-time act. It took place at, at salvation, and it should have been complete. It should have been done. How many times do you bury people? Once. Once. How many times do we die? Once. But boys, us Christians, we keep digging up that old man, don't we? You know, we keep digging him up and <laughs> trying to revive him, you know? Because that's what sin has to do. We have to revive that old dead man. We are in Christ. And as he died in our place, Romans 5, 6, and 6 through 8, we also are counted dead with him. And if we are dead, how can we respond to sin? Go up to somebody sitting in a, laying in a casket that's died and poke them and see if they do anything. Now, don't do that. That's really disrespectful. But, <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yell at them. Hey! And see if they blink. They're not going to respond. They're dead. And God is using that as the symbolism how we're supposed to be responding to sin. When sin comes along, when temptation comes along, it ought to be able to do like this. Hey, I'm talking to you. Hey, I'm talking to you. And we don't even respond. Because why? We're dead to sin. We died to that. Verse 3 says, Know ye not that so many as of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? We were baptized into His death. We were put into His death. The word baptized means to be completely immersed. Most people think that means in water, but sometimes it means other things. When we look at John's baptism, it was in water. 
When we hear of Jesus' baptism, it's in the Spirit. When we hear of baptism by fire, we understand that to be persecution or trials. We're immersed in those things. This instance does not refer to baptism by water. Paul is actually using the word baptize in a way that we might be saying someone was immersed in his work or that we underwent this baptism by fire experiencing some kind of trouble. We were immersed in the trouble. All Christians placing their faith in Christ have been spiritually immersed into the person and body of Jesus Christ. That's a cool concept, and I don't think sometimes people understand that. It is amazing what happens. I've said many times as I'm baptizing, when you get saved, there's 39 transactions that take place. That's what people have told me. I've never looked them up, but I believe it. I'm sure there's that many or more. One of those is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where you are taking your prayer and saying, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and save me. At that moment, the Holy Spirit takes you and puts you into Christ. Into Him. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptized into Christ. You're baptized into Him. That's not a water baptism. That's a, that's a spiritual baptism. And He puts you into Christ so that you are covered in His righteousness. You are in Christ. That way you walk up to the Father. And the Father looks at you and you are in Christ. That's why He accepts you. Amen. That's why you're part of the family. We have that, that phrase, in Christ... Is, is spoken 77 times in the New Testament. In Christ. We have been put into the body of Christ. But then the verse goes on, the passage goes on, verse 44, if we died with Him, then we have been resurrected with Him, verse 4. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death. We are, put in, we are in Him and we're put to death with Him. And so we're buried with Him in death. Our water baptism is symbolic of that because we say buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. So when we put the person under the water, they're buried with him in the likeness of his death. It's a picture of what happens to a person as the Holy Spirit baptizes them into the body of Christ. But we don't leave them there, right? <laughs> aren't you glad? I tell somebody sometimes, I say, you know, they say, well, how long will you leave me under? I say, until you turn blue, of course, you know. <laughs> it's not a baptism unless you turn blue. No, you don't leave them down there because they would die. But they're raised. They, we don't leave them there. We resurrect them. And that's the point of this text. He says, therefore, we are buried with him in baptism of death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So we were not physically dead, but we were spiritually. And we were not physically raised, but we were spiritually resurrected. It says, but like as Christ, that's symbolic, raised from the, for the purpose of the glory of the Father. Our new life in Christ is one that brings glory to God. That's our purpose, to bring glory to the Father. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead. We were buried in life. That's our, that's our salvation. We were, we, we were put into Christ. And then we're resurrected. Why? Why are we brought back? Why are we, why are we still here? Because God has a purpose for us to be here. Now as we are covered in His righteousness, now that we've received His grace, there's a purpose for us, and that is to live, to bring glory to the Father. That's where I think many Christians miss it. They forget that's what it's all about. Or maybe they've never learned, or maybe no one's ever taught you. Your purpose is to bring glory to the Father. You were saved for that reason. He said, I thought I was saved so I'd go to heaven. That's true, but beyond that. I mean, if that's all you've got, praise God, you got the foundation. But God wants you to build on that foundation. And that's a life filled with purpose. That's glorifying God, the way we live, the way we pay our bills, the way we, we react with others, the way we, we respond to situations. God wants us to bring glory to Him. Amen. That's why He says, for the last part, even so we also should walk in newness of life. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Wherefore, therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do to the glory of God. Praise God, yesterday Ruby and I got to eat in a restaurant. Amen. Hallelujah! Woo! Express chicken. If you get there at the right time, there's not enough people in there, they'll let you come in and you can sit at one of the tables they've marked off. We sat and ate express chicken yesterday inside. Oh, it was newness of life, amen? <laughs> if there was ever newness of life. 
But whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever, do all to the glory of God. Praising Him, thanking Him, making an expression on those around you that you have a belief in a Savior, a belief in a God that's eternal. That's what we're to do. We have that responsibility. Colossians 1.10 says that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians. This is important. Once you're saved, now you've got to move forward. Walking worthy. Move. Don't lay in your crib, suck in your thumb. Get up and start walking. Learn to walk. Walk, in the worthy, walk worthy of the calling that He's called you to. Walk. Worthy of the Lord. And then it says unto all pleasing, being fruitful. Fruitful in everything you do. Yes, in winning people to Christ. A lot of people want to make that just about soul winning, but it's so much more than that. It's every part of your life, in your character, in your attributes, in, in the way you treat people. Those are the fruit that God has given you to demonstrate to others in every good work. And then, don't miss this one, increasing in the knowledge of God. That's why you come to church, I hope. To increase in your knowledge of God. That's why you read your Bible. To increase in your knowledge of God. If you've gotten stale, if you've gotten to the place where you think, well, I've learned enough. I've, I've got all I need. I think I can make it now. And you've quit learning of God. You are missing the boat. Because here's the thing. As long as you're learning of God, you're moving this way. The minute you say, I've reached my goal. I don't need to learn Him anymore. You're moving this way. You don't plateau off. You don't stay there. You just start going backwards. It just doesn't work. My, my new little Buick, I don't understand it anyway. I took it to the car manufacturer because I thought they made a mistake. All my cars up this time, when I pull up on a hill and I stop, I can take my foot off the brake and accelerate and it stays there, right? That Buick Enclave won't do that. It stays for three seconds and then all of a sudden it starts rolling back. I thought something was wrong with it. I took it in. But you know what? That's exactly what Christians do. Christians think we're like, the, like many of the cars. We pull up and we stop and we just stay there. No, the minute you stop, you start rolling backwards. You're like that Buick Enclave out there. You're just rolling backwards. You're not where you are. You're not where you ought to be. You're not moving where God wants you because you've stopped. We need to always be increasing in the knowledge of God. That's part of that purpose that God has. And if you want to experience the best that God has, you've got to be in God's Word. You've got to be learning about God all the time. All right, so he says, Therefore we are buried with him by the baptism unto death, that like as Christ raised up from the dead, be the glory of the Father. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. Verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. Now, I'll be honest with you, I get tickled at that statement. You know, um, if we were having a funeral and I said, uh, they'd say, where's the internment? We're planting them over in uh, Pioneer Cemetery. You'd laugh at that, wouldn't you? But that's what he's talking about. We're planted together. He's referring to his death. He's referring to going to the grave. He's referring to that. We're planted together in the likeness of his death. Jesus died for our sins. As, and it is through his death that, we pay, that he paid the penalty for our sin. And at salvation, we've received the forgiveness of sin. And that is totally awesome. But that's not all that we received. That's what I want you to know. You plant a seed in the ground, that's not the end of the seed, amen? There's something else that's coming. It's going to produce something better than just that old dry seed, amen? You are like that seed God has planted you. Now God's expecting you to grow into something other than an old dead seed. We are to be His workmanship. We are to be His, His witness. We are to be the demonstration of His power. We have also in the likeness of His resurrection. We've been planted together now to be brought forth. We have the ability to walk in the power of His resurrection. Why? Because we've been buried with Him in the likeness of His death. We can be raised with Him in the likeness of His resurrection. How was He resurrected? In power. Power of God that raised Him from the grave. This is something we should seek after like Paul did. I want you to look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. This is one of those passages that just, I think we just could stay here forever. Paul, I think right here in these few verses, Paul gives the secret of his success. This is why Paul was successful. It was all of God, but understand, Paul understood that there was some things that, were, that, were, that he had 
that he wanted to develop, that God had given him, that he wanted to see grow in his life. Verse, verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. So he's lost everything. You know, Paul was pretty successful. He was a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was in the hierarchy of Judaism. He, he, he would move to the higher level. He was moving to, I think he had much. Uh, you know, he was moving to being the guy that people look at and say, man, that guy's got it together. And all of a sudden he said, I've lost everything. I've given up everything because I want to know Jesus Christ. Most people won't give up. They won't give up 30 minutes a, a Sunday to know more about Jesus. You know, Paul says, I give up everything to know about Jesus. I've given up all things for the loss of the excellency of knowledge of Christ Jesus, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. He's not talking about salvation there. He's talking about that sanctification. He's talking about knowing him as full as I can. I want to know everything I can about my God. I want to know everything I can about this Savior. I want to know about his righteousness. I want to know about his resurrection. I want to know about his power. I want to know about everything that he's given me. I want to know it all. Not that I can just know it, but that I can live in it. See, that's what he says in verse 9. And be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He said, I know I have that. That is something I have, and I want to understand it to its fullest. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his suffering. Did I forget my last sheet? No. Hallelujah. The fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his death. Paul said, I want to know him. Oh, I want to know my Savior. When I met Ruby, from the moment I met her, my desire was to know her. I wanted to know her. I wanted to know what she thought. I wanted to know what she liked to eat. I wanted to know the places she liked to go. I wanted to please her. I wanted to find ways that I could, that I could understand her. After 50 years of marriage, I'm still working on that. <laughs> or 50 years of relationship. 49 years of marriage, 50 years of relationship. I'm still working on that. But I don't give up. I continue to want to know. And you know what? That's the way we ought to be about God. It ought to be that kind of consumption. It ought to just consume us. This idea of knowing Christ. I want to know what he thinks. I want to know what he feels. I want to know what it's like when he speaks to my heart. I want to know what it's like when he's hurting I want to know what it's like when he's rejoicing. I want to know what it's like whenever he's pleased with what I do. I want to know, I want to know everything I can about the Lord. I want to know what his favorite color is. What is God's favorite color? Have you ever thought about it? Look around. Green? Green or blue, I think. Amen. It's one or the other. Seems like everything has that. I want to know his favorite color. I want to know his, I want to know his favorite food. You know, it seems like he liked fish a lot. His favorite person, Ruby says. Yes, I, I know that person. <laughs> but we ought to want to know. We ought to be consumed with the idea, I want to know Jesus. Oh, I want to know him. I just want to spend time with him. I want to, I want to, just, I want to walk with him. I want to just talk with him. I, I want to hear his voice every time he speaks, whether he's yelling at me or he's speaking in the softest of tones. I want to hear him. I want to know him. Verse 6 and 7, he goes on saying, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed and henceforth we should not serve sin. The old man is dead. I love that old song that people have sung now recently. The old man is dead. Amen. He's dead. He's dead. He doesn't have the power he once had in my life. This body of sin was controlled by my sin nature, but that old man now is dead. Its ability to control has been destroyed. It no longer has that same ability. Why? Because I've died to the old man. So we should not serve sin any longer. Let's get the victory over that. Let's stand in the power of God that we can live in sinlessness. I mean it. Yes, there's an exception clause. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. I understand that. But that's an exception, not the rule to the Christian. We've been freed from sin. Verse 7 says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Amen. A dead person can't respond to anything. 
A person that's dead to sin should not respond to sin. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. I've died. Nevertheless, I live, he says. And then verse 8, and if we are dead, we know we shall live. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Verse 9 says we'll live forever, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. We have that same truth in us. And again, I think that's part of our sanctification. I think it's important for our sanctification to understand that. I've died to this life. This life is meaningless in that sense, that it has, it has nothing to offer me except the opportunity to glorify Christ. That's all this life is good for. You realize that? I glorify my children, I glorify my marriage, I glorify my work, I glorify the things I do. But that's what this life is about now. Before I was saved, it was all about money, it was all about power, it was all about climbing the ladder, it was all about things. Now it's not that. Why? Because my life is wrapped up in eternity. My, my life is like with Christ. Knowing that Christ be raised from the dead, He died no more, I die no more. And then the verse goes on, death hath, not, hath no more dominion over him. Like I said, death has no more power. To the Christian, we understand that when we go to a funeral, we rejoice. Why? Death doesn't have any power. The doctor says, you have a terminal disease. It looks like you're not going to last another six months. And we go, at first it devastates us, but then all of a sudden we realize, hey, I'm the winner. Because we die no more. And verse 10 says, For in that he died, he died unto sin once. It's a once for all thing that we are saved. Once for all. And then verse 10 goes on, But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. See, he says, here's what you have in salvation, but don't stop there. Live unto God. We've been saved by grace. Now we ought to live by grace. Most of us go around rejoicing over our salvation. That's wonderful. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice over your salvation. But let me tell you something. If that's all in the world you ever rejoice about, you're missing, you're missing the biggest part of the boat. You haven't enjoyed all the other aspects that God has for you. I mean, it'd be like going on a cruise and getting on board and standing by the door, the rest of the cruise, because, hey, I made it. <laughs> Have you been up on top deck? No, nope, I made it. That's all I need. Have you seen the shows? No, nope, no, nope, I, I made it. I'm right here. I'm good. I'm right here. That's all. Hey, listen, I made it. I made it. I made it. And that's all they have. And they miss out on the whole thing that God has for them. God has given us so much in this thing called grace and salvation. Don't be satisfied just to be stuck at the very birth. Grow. Live. Experience all that God has for you and learn to, to, to grow in Him. Learn about Him in everything you do. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Listen, if you're listening to me or you're here, uh, I want you to think this morning, first of all, if you're not saved, if you don't know Christ, if you're living underneath the bondage of sin, my goodness, God has given you salvation. That is the greatest gift of all. And He wants you to walk in that salvation. He wants you to experience that eternal life. He died for you once. He wants you to be saved. And He's ready to receive you if you will come to Him by faith. And He will save you by His grace. That's His promise. How do you do that, Brother Jim? Well, I tell you what I did. I was a nine-year-old little boy. I didn't know a lot about salvation. I didn't know a lot about the Bible. But I knew John 3.16. And it said, God so loved me that He gave His only Son that if I would believe on Him, I'd never perish but have everlasting life. And I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ that day. Very simply, as a little child, all I knew to do was just pray and say, God, I'm sorry I sinned. I want to go to heaven. Receive me. Cleanse me. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. And he did. Amen. Once for all. Amen. Praise God. I'll die no more. But then, dear child of God, the message is for us this morning. I hope you hear it. Some of you have gotten stuck. Some of you have plateaued and you think you're doing okay. You're not. You are dead in the water. You need to be growing. You need to be, you need to be and if you've become complacent, if you've become uh, uh, apathetic, if you've become lazy in your faith, get up. Don't be a couch potato Christian. Get up 
and start living for Christ. Whatever you do, let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you for this morning. I pray, Father, for those that are watching and these, Father, that are in our building. We pray, God, that we would listen to the message this morning. You've given us a great message about our growth. And I pray, Father, we would capture that thought in such a unique way. Lord, let us, as your children, walk in the power of the resurrection, experiencing and sharing the grace that you've given. And then, Father, I pray for those that might have for the first time realized, I'm not, I'm not even saved. Lord, I pray today that they might receive you as their Lord and Savior. If this morning you have made a decision for Christ like that, we sure would like to hear from you. If by internet you're watching, if you've made a decision for Christ, would you send us a note? Send me a private message, if you will. Let me just visit with you and uh, share with you some things that will help you to grow as a Christian. Dear child of God, if you've made a decision this morning, walk in that grace. It's up to you, but know that we're here to help you. If you need some help or encouragement about what do I do next, give us a call. Give us a, give us a chance to sit down with you and share that with you. We love you. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you again for this day. And, Lord, I pray that you would bless our time that we've had now in the Word of God and bless the time that's coming as we go into the Word of God again at the Sunday School Hour. We love you and thank you for our church. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. We will see you at 945 for Sunday school if you're coming back. And then uh, also this evening at 630 for our evening service. God bless you.